<laughs> things are heating up in the political arena. It really is a show to sit back and watch. And the person that you want in the seat next to you, giving you the popcorn and giving you the backstory is our one and our only Dave Dulio, professor of political science and the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. Great to have you with us again. Thank Thanks you for, for taking time. Good, nice to talk to you. It, it always seems like every time we talk, you say the same thing, that things are heating up. It just keeps <laughs> getting hotter and hotter. I, it, because I will say, I, you think one thing can't top another and it tops another. <laughs> You're just like, is this the new norm here for our political scene? Right, how many times have we said, I think I've seen it all to only then turn around and see something else, right? Uh, that we don't expect. I will say that, and it, but you know, we should kind of start out and talk about um, the passing of former Senator 11, uh, because he was such really a giant and an icon in the political world here in the state of Michigan. Did you ever have the opportunity uh, to meet him? I met him one time in passing uh, when I was on Capitol Hill. It was for the briefest of moments, but it was a it was a highlight, right? Because, as you said, he was a giant, not just here in Michigan politics, but nationally. Uh, he was somebody who had incredible respect in the United States Senate uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, for his uh, his seriousness, his uh, uh, commitment. And, and was really somebody who, um, when he retired, was missed by, by hundreds of people, thousands of people in the Senate uh, for his approach, but also because of his length of service, the, the institutional memory that, that left the Senate when he left the Senate um, is sorely missed. And I will say, um, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity uh, as a reporter, you interviewed them multiple times and he was always extremely gracious and it didn't matter the situation and he was always very gracious and stopped, took the time to uh, talk with you. But I will say with him too, it's what you're talking about that respect across the aisles how would he do in today's environment? Because it was different. And we should know that he actually started in 1979. Um, and the other thing, uh, Fox 2, uh, you know, upon his passing, they did one of these look back stories. I didn't realize he was on the Detroit City Council. Really something, his history here in Southeast Michigan uh, is obviously deep and, and, and long. And, and I think the, the, the question of how he would do today, Carl Levin would do just fine in, in uh, American politics today. It's everybody else that we have to worry about, right? And, and it's, it, he would do just fine because of, of the kind of person that he was and the approach that he had. Uh, it's the it's the other folks, the flamethrowers and the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the folks that want to just sort of light politics on fire these days. They're the ones that are um, the, the are making it so that every time we talk, there's something else to talk about. Right. <laughs> And, you know, um, again, we're talking with Dave Dulio, professor of political science and director for the Center for Civic Engagement over at Oakland University. And uh, we were really lucky to have him kind of be the face of Michigan and our advocate as well, because the one thing he did, he went after corporate America. Absolutely. Uh, he There, there was... Uh few people during his time in the Senate and, or in Congress generally uh, who were as effective or as staunch a, a defender and, and supporter of his constituents. So with that, uh, can we talk a little bit? Yesterday was primaries. I was a little disappointed because we didn't have any issues here in our local area. Uh, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm just going to lay it out. I'm that voter, I want the sticker. <laughs> but we didn't have anything here locally in the Kegel Harbor area. But uh, sitting where you sit, any surprises coming out of the primary? I think for me, um, Pontiac's going to be looking at a new mayor. It seems like that is the case. Uh, that was a, that was not a surprising result. I think the, the, 
big hurdle that the current mayor was facing was the, the fact that she had to run as a write-in candidate. And, and that's always difficult, uh, let alone with, with relatively little time to prepare and mount a write-in campaign. Uh, so I think that that was, when that decision was made, um, it, it really did help and, and vault uh, former state rep Tim Grimel really to the top of the list. It, it, it's, it's going to be interesting. And I will say I'm uh, so interested because Pontiac is the back door mm -hmm. to Kegel Harbor. And I think that's one thing with politics, hopefully coming out of COVID, that people are starting to pay attention to the hyper local. Yeah, elections. well, that, that's such a good point, because as you know, the uh, it's those local offices, it's, it's the local politics that when push comes to shove are, are what really impact uh, Americans' daily life the most. Yeah. The, the stuff that's happening in Washington or even in Lansing to, to some degree, um, is we're removed from that. And it's, it's really, it really falls to the local elected officials uh, for daily quality of life uh, services that we come to depend on from, from city, municipal, local government. That's really where our bread is buttered. And, and it, it would be great if more folks would take an interest in and, and pay attention to their local politics. But frankly, based on voter turnout yesterday, that doesn't seem to be the case. They really don't. And I will say, um, and this is an interview for another day, although this is our last interview <laughs> because I'm done on Friday, but we'll talk about more that uh, on that lady. But I, I will say um, the judicial side of the whole political arena has been fascinating to me because it's so hard to get information about the people running um, for judges mm -hmm. in our community or in our state, but they really do hold so much power. And we've seen that with Whitmer and the emergency, um, the emergency orders. Right, absolutely. And it, it, the, we have a very unique, that's a kind way of putting it, unique <laughs> Uh, way of, of selecting our judges in, in Michigan, right? And, and where we do, we, we elect all of them, except when there's a vacancy, then, then there's an appointment that's, that, is, uh, that fills that vacancy. But take the Supreme Court, for example, the Michigan Supreme Court. It is a nonpartisan office um, that is on election day, but the only way that you can get on the ballot for that nonpartisan office is through nomination by a political party. It is a it's a it's a screwy way that we do it um, that I think, frankly, leads to some increased cynicism about uh, about the court itself, right? Because we're we're when when we read stories about it, uh, we we read or hear that it was a uh, Republican nominated justice or a Democratic nominated justice, right? And and I think that that just injects that little bit of politics and partisanship into. Uh, an office that I think everybody expects and demands is free of that politics. And I will say, uh, Dave, I don't know if you uh, know this, but I worked for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. And as a federal agency, I have witnessed the difference between going Democrat to Republican under Trump and people who think that politics do not play a role in our law enforcement agencies, you are kidding yourself. Well, uh, it, and it, it's sad. It really is sad. I was so disappointed. It, it, it's a problem, right? I mean, it, and, and, and in, in an agency like ATF, right, that, that's another one that we, we would hope and expect would be free of that. But when we're talking about uh, federal agencies like that with appointees that are uh, that come and go with presidential administrations uh it it is uh we're, we're fooling ourselves to think that politics doesn't enter into those uh, decisions or uh staffing choices etc well we're seeing that right now uh even here in the state of michigan uh with whitmer uh and you have dana nessel the attorney general, and you don't think that the two of them, uh, you know, come together to make those decisions. I'm telling you, as someone who's been behind the scenes, there is a lot of conversations going on before they go public with anything. But uh, it, it, with that, though, can I ask you about your opinion 
And how do you think COVID-19 is going to play in the upcoming elections? Because it seemed like for a while, it may be in our rear view mirror, but now we're having the issue with the Delta COVID or the Delta variant. And uh, some states are going, uh, well, you have to wear a mask now. Businesses are doing that here in the state of Michigan. However, Whitmer is taking a step back and she's blaming it on the uh, Republicans. Well, I, I think that um, to answer your the, the first part of that question, the COVID is going to be an issue. Uh, there, there's no doubt. The, the longer it it sticks around in a in a way that is uh, where it seems to dominate the headlines, the the longer that's the case, the more important it's going to be um, come election day, 2022. And and that's hard to even fathom that that we're uh, what 15 months or so away from. Uh, from that election. And I mean, we, everybody, there's not one person who doesn't hope that COVID is behind us by that, but it's going to be, it's going to be an issue with the way that um, uh, those in office who are running for reelection, like the governor, uh, the way that they have handled it until now, and the way that they handle things moving forward uh, is going to be an issue that is uh, brought up by their opponents. And, and I think, and maybe I'm a, uh, not a, maybe I am, I am a cynic in, in many ways. And I think I've said this on your show that I see politics everywhere. Politics is everywhere. And, and I think that we, if, if you just assume that, you can, you're, you're in a better spot to, to look at decisions that are made. And I think it's, um, it, it's, it's intriguing. I, I will not say that I know this for sure because I'm not in those conversations, but it's intriguing to, to look at the way uh, Governor Whitmer's handled uh, the the latest uh, surge in cases with the Delta variant compared to what it was several months ago and and this time last year, and it, it's it's not too hard to make a connection between a, a, a shift in strategy. It seems to me, uh, at least thus far, a shift in strategy, uh, and connecting that with an upcoming campaign cycle. You know, I'm right in line with you because I will say when you talk about being a cynic, I'm the same way. And when people always ask, I don't know why people want to know what you are. I'm like, I'm an independent. I've been a journalist long enough to know that both sides of the system right. work the system. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if you don't buy into that, what are you doing? Like, I, I, I feel like 24 um, hour cable has been the downside of journalism, but that's a conversation for another day. Because I will say, uh, one of the surprising things is when we're talking about Whitmer and we're talking about the state of Michigan, um, Betsy DeVos, does she have a chance here in the state of Michigan? She wasn't a well-liked appointee of Trump. How does she think she's gonna run for governor? Well, I'm, I, I don't even, I've just heard rumblings. Right, and there are, there are rumors out there, and 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 they're not even to the point where um, they're as they're. I don't think they're being taken as seriously as the rumors were about former Chief Craig uh, when when those rumors were out there. There seemed to be a lot more smoke around uh, those rumors than there are about um, uh, the former Education Secretary. But you're you're exactly right. I mean, it. She was, in some respects, uh, enemy number one for uh, not an enemy number one, enemy number two, because for the left in the Trump era, it, Trump was that number one, he still is, right? But, but well, and he, he's, he's basically going to say he's running for 2024, so. Well, I, that, that'll, that'll be another shakeup, right? When in, in American politics, if, in, if that happens. But uh, the former education secretary, uh, well-known, obviously, the name, name recognition off the charts in, in Michigan, uh, given her family's history here, uh, but is a is a was a constant target during her time as education secretary, and frankly remains a target uh, for uh, for many on the left. And and I think that that would that would make it a, a really an uphill battle uh, for her uh, not only to win in a general, but to to secure the Republican nomination. I think Republicans at some point will become pragmatic. Uh, about their primary and say, okay, are we going to fight amongst ourselves? Are we going to violate that Reagan rule of never speak ill of another Republican? Um, or are we going to try to focus on 
uh, the, the end prize, right, which is retaking the governor's mansion. And I will say, if she's looking for a place to uh, offload a few million dollars instead of doing a campaign, I'll take some of your money. <laughs> you know, I can think of a lot of causes that can use that money. But with that way, you know, because we're kind of talking about, you know, we know there's been a division within the Republican Party. I think what's going to be interesting is to sit back on the Democratic side and the bombshell that came out yesterday out of New York with Como. Right. It, it, there's so many uh, aspects of that that are, are interesting, fascinating, important, whatever, whatever moniker you want to put on it. But it, it is uh, bombshell is, I think, a, is often an overused term, but it's appropriate in this case. The, the number of allegations, the, the, the strength of the report from uh, a Democratic attorney general in New York, the statement from the president, another Democrat, right, calling on the governor to resign, saying that he should resign. Uh, it, it's, this is obviously critical time for Governor Cuomo. How he handles this in the next couple of days um, is gonna be really interesting to watch. Now, he seems to say he's not gonna resign. Uh, it, it is, I think, hard to see how he survives this, both uh, with the, the, you know, we're, we're still in the Me Too era, yep. and uh, it, there are also, it, it seems, possible criminal charges coming from this. That might give the state legislature a bit more uh, ammunition to go after him on an, on an impeachment uh, inquiry, uh, although we've seen uh, another Democratic governor embroiled in scandal simply dig his heels in and survive it. Ralph Northam in Virginia uh, with not just accusations, but admission of uh, appearing in racist garb uh, is still the governor of Virginia. And that, would, that seemed uh, impossible uh, right when those stories were breaking. But he dug his heels in, said, I'm not resigning, and he's still there, in part because it seems like a lot of people forgot about it. He said, I'm not resigning, and people just moved on, right? I moved on. <laughs> I will say, I, I remember that, and I was thinking, there's no way, especially in, in the climate right. that we were in at the time. And we should note that climate plays a lot about how they uh, really survive some of these scandals. And um, with that though, we only have another minute or two with you here on the Megacast, but if I can ask you, um, it's really sobering to me to think that we are coming up on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And uh, I remember where I was that day. Where were you? Uh, I was in Washington. Uh, we, my wife and I lived there at the time. Uh, she worked four box, four blocks from the White House, um, and it was it was scary. Uh, to, I was on campus in graduate school. She was working uh, downtown. It took her hours to get up out of the city. It took us hours to get home from there, just across the river in Virginia. We could see the smoke from the Pentagon uh, from the rooftop of our apartment building. It was I get the chill, chills just now talking about it. But uh, it is twenty years. It's a long time. And, and uh, I think I know where you're going with this. We're gonna, we're gonna have an event on campus on uh, September 9th uh, to, to remember 9-11, to talk about issues related to 9-11 uh, with uh, Congresswoman Slotkin, who was um, impacted in her career uh, by uh, the terrorist attacks. She was recruited into the CIA not long after that. She's gonna be joined by former Congressman Mike Rogers uh, who also uh, represented Oakland County during his time in, in Congress. He was in Congress on 9-11, went on to become chairman of the House Intelligence Committee uh, and, and is uh, a true expert in, in that arena. Uh, so they're going to uh, come together to talk about issues related to 9-11, which is really important for us on a college campus because more than half of our students weren't even born. Wow. Which is, it's just, it makes me feel old, I, but it... <laughs> It, it really sh shook me, uh, that realization um, that so many young people today 
uh, did not grow up with that as a memory or as uh, or, or knowing about it in, in ways that, that you and I do. But with that as well, it's what I remember about 9-11, once we got past the day, was the eeriness of the skies being silent because mm -hmm. no planes were flying, but then the unity of our entire country. Why can we not get back there? Well, that's a great question. And, and we did have that for sure. And, and it, but I think if we look back on it, honestly, uh, it eroded pretty quickly. And, you know, there, there was a big rally around the flag effect, um, which we see in, in, we saw in President Bush's approval rating at the time, uh, it went up to 90%. And then it, it eroded pretty quickly after that. So the country can come together. It's, it's, a, it's about keeping it together. Dave Dulio with us here, Professor of Political Science and the Director for the Center for Civic Engagement over at Oakland University. Dave, I, I just want to take a moment and say thank you uh, for always taking time to speak with us here on the Megacast. But I've learned so much talking with you. And uh, one day I'm going to sit in on one of your classes. Well, Ronnie, Do you thank accept you. old people? <laughs> <laughs> We call we call uh, we call those folks non-traditional students. So absolutely, uh, but Ronnie, thank you for the always for the opportunities. It's been great talking to you. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best as you uh, as you move forward in your career. Thank you so much. And again, uh, Dave Dulio, Oakland University. Any college student out there, you would be so lucky to have him as a professor. Um, always engaging. So thank you again. Uh, I've learned so much talking to you. We appreciate your time. Thank you.